you're skinny and you're frail and you're fatigued. And you're looking at yourself in the mirror thinking, this is not who I am. This is not where I expect it to be. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down the Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. Point, right? you're, you're going to a I could never often. not go back. They were my friends and they felt the trouble like the like She did say, so. you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our boys. Hugo Tooby is a captain in the Australian Army. While still serving his country in uniform, he has survived two battles with cancer and is devoted to promote the power of talking about our health in our day to day, to end the stigma as it just might save a life. Hugo, welcome to Life on the Line. G'day, Alex. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure to have you. Hugo, do you remember when you first had an interest in the military? Yeah, look, it's uh, I'm probably a different one for a lot of your your guests you've had on the show, Alex, in terms of I never really had army running through my blood, if you want to call it that, growing up. Uh, I never had any family history in the army or in the military at all. So to be honest, for me, it was a, it was a bit of a different approach when I kind of didn't actually know what I wanted to do when I left school. So I kind of uh, heard about the Australian Defence Force Academy and I, it, I was quite fascinated in it. And basically, it wasn't really until kind of year 10 and 11 at school when I did a bit of research into it. I thought, well, gee, that sounds pretty cool. I liked the idea of you know, being out of your comfort zone, also sort of studying. And then that's kind of how it, how it happened. And before I knew it, I left school and, and joined ADFA at the end of 2009. So that was kind of my, <laughs> my kind of background into, into joining the Army. And I don't want to force you to apply hindsight where it doesn't exist, I guess. But if you look back to before, say, year 10 or 11, do you look back on things like exposure to Anzac and Remembrance Days or just studying history at school? Like looking back, did any of that resonate with you in any particular way or you just really sort of had a late awakening to it? No, it, it is a good point, actually. You, you mentioned that it's, although I say I haven't had any family history as such as serving members, every year we always went to, when I say we, my twin brother and my, my old man, we always went to Anzac Days. Definitely a family tradition and it's something we were very supportive of, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, growing up, sort of being a younger kid, I always liked the, the war movies and those type of type of things and those, yeah, history at school definitely did interest me and and doing a couple of those research projects. So it definitely was there. It just, I didn't have that connection as such as a lot of people do with, with the family history of serving members and the like. No, not a first degree connection, but that cultural exposure and appreciation, which mm. I think is a great reflection on our country. Yeah, absolutely. So you go into study to be an officer? So that was uh, commencing 2010. So yeah, I basically left school. So I was only a young sort of naive 18 year old and, uh, and yeah, joined the, uh, the officer pathway. And I, I chose to go through ADVA rather than straight Royal Military College done through entry. To me, it was kind of a, a nice transition rather than getting thrown straight into the deep end. It was kind of the, the middle water, if you could call it that, because it was kind of the mixture of a bit of the university lifestyle mixed with a bit of army lifestyle, which I thought was quite appealing at the time. Because for a civilian who might not appreciate the difference, the Royal Military College Duntroon, like you say, straight in the deep end, straight into full military exposure, whereas ADFA, you're studying as well as that beyond just the military component. So that's equipping yourself for, I guess, a potential life after service from one perspective, or just giving you that broader exposure and knowledge base. And you were studying business. Yeah, yeah. So I studied business. And to be honest with you, I've always wanted to study and I've always wanted to get some education as far as the university goes. So I think ADFA is very good for that because it actually, it is quite appealing for people that can still get the mixture of a, a university education. And I, I did study a Bachelor of Business, but then you also mix it in with that army training. Whereas, you know, if I went straight done Troon, I wouldn't have actually got that, that university qualification, which is something I've actually always wanted to get. Yeah, I wonder about the intensity of that, I suppose. And I mean, you're juggling the quite cerebral aspect of the university degree and the army training. There's still a lot of knowledge to learn, especially on the officer pathway. But I imagine there's also a physical component too, and it'd be quite a mixed experience. Yeah, it is. So it's definitely not your typical university. And it is quite funny because my, I've got a twin brother 
he went to Bond University in Gold Coast and uh, it, it, we did have quite different experiences because he's kind of living your almost your, your classic frat lifestyle, American college type lifestyle at Bond University. And then I'm kind of doing the, the uh, up at 6am still doing, you know, PT and army training and stuff mixed in with going to lectures and, and that type of thing. So look, it definitely was different to your typical university. And look, that being said, it definitely wasn't, uh, wasn't so intensive as far as like I mentioned before, being chucked straight to the deep end. But we still had the whole first six weeks, getting your head shaved, marching around, square gating, all that type of fun stuff as a, a young 18-year-old. There was that initial six-week training. And then it kind of from there, it was sort of battle blocks and, and field components and, and military education and you know obviously ongoing PT throughout the week. And they kind of mixed it in with the university. And as you get more exposure to that military side of things, what cause start to take your interest to head into? Well, so for me, it was always, even earlier on, I've always had an appreciation for business. And as far as not just your typical business in the corporate setting, but how business is much bigger than that. The business mindset of being in the military, it always fascinated me with how, what makes the military work and, and the logistics behind operating and, and the, the functionality of, of working in such a huge organization, you know, the, the army's got what over 80,000 employees type of thing. So it always, the logistical side really, really appealed to me and the mechanics of that. So even early on, I've always, and I, I think that aligned quite well with studying a, a bachelor of business. So the subjects I was doing at a university setting also really interest me as far as the, what potentially I'd be doing post training, as far as what core I, I ended up choosing. And that's kind of what, what aligned me to that pathway of logistics. It has been said throughout history that leaders win through logistics in many ways. I mean, supply lines are everything. When those mm. collapse, military campaigns fail. And for the civilian listener, can we chat a bit more about that logistics role? And that's in a domestic context. That's in a deployment context, because in you know those popular action movies that you and I watched growing up, we just really see that frontline stuff and the heroes in the gunfights and all the action explosions. And you have that frontline tip of the spear but there's actually that whole shaft that is needed to make that tip of the spear actually <laughs> practical and work. Otherwise, you're just holding a dagger that's got limited reach or usefulness. Yeah, you know, you hit the nail on the head there, Alex, because I assume if they made a Saving Private Ryan, which focused on the, uh, the Q store and the logistical side of, of pushing out the ammunition and supply work, it wouldn't be as entertaining. <laughs> Equipping Private Ryan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So look, and you can see that. And yeah, of course, you know, a lot of the infantry soldiers or the, the combat corps, they do get the glory and, and look, and fair enough too, so, you know, that they do a lot of what they do, especially on deployments is pretty full on, right? But spot on, like, I guess for those listening who aren't, I guess, knowledge in the, the fundamental parts of the army, picture the front line or those movies we're talking about it's it's the basics on how you get your ammunition how you get your food how you get your water how, how a soldier on deployment or on exercise can basically survive or live with the supplies that they need and then they can then carry out their duties and their job their core job role so it's basically the bigger picture stuff on how and <laughs> your classic uh, infantry soldier will probably say that you know logistics just happens um, which uh look some people think it might but there is a lot that goes obviously into it think transport I think ammunition, explosive ordnance. Food and water, I mean. Food and water, the basics, you know, how a foot soldier out in, on a deployment is going to live with, you know, X amount of water. How are you going to do supply drop for food and replenishments and recovering vehicle assets and armories? And it, the list goes on. There's just so much that goes into the, the logistic field of, of the army. And like you said, the way I like to say it, it's basically behind the scenes. So it's the behind the scenes on the glory up front and how that, I guess, happens really. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, the army has 80,000 people in it at the moment. And then they imagine when that scales up in a larger country like the United States or in the context of a larger war where we deliberately scale up our forces, that just kind of demand is essential. And so I can totally envisage what you're up to theoretically in that day-to-day -day on a deployment context. What does that mean for you on a home context when you're based in Australia like you are at the moment. Yeah, so look, it, once again, it can vary. And me personally, although once I graduated uh, Duntroon, I went down the field of RAOC, being the Royal Australian Army Ordnance Corps, but I'm also a general service officer. So I didn't, I don't actually have a trade as such. You get some people who graduate at RAOC and they might choose to be a petroleum officer or an ammo technician, which, you know, that's self-explanatory and what their 
specific field is. Whereas for me, although I'm a rayoc logistics officer, it's quite broad in what I can do. So, you know, I could be running up a supply company on exercise and those types of things. Or at the moment, my current role is it's got nothing to do with logistics and I'm actually the, the unit welfare officer. So, you know, as we'll probably find out in my story, <laughs> welfare is something close to my heart. But once again, it's got nothing to do with my actual core role as a rayoc officer. But because I'm a general service officer, it's quite broad in what you actually do. Okay, so we have that context on what your role is and the role, jumping back into the story, the role you're working towards. So you've studied at ADFA, you then move on to RMC after you graduate. Yeah, so if you're joining as a officer, you can either go 18 months straight RMC or you can go three years at ADFA and then 12 months of RMC. So it's kind of, I, I chose that pathway once again, I got the degree. So all up, it's a four-year block of training to eventually graduate as a, a lieutenant in the Australian Army or an 18-month block training, but just at RMC. So you're at RMC in 2013. It's your fourth year of training to graduate as a lieutenant. And you've got this roadmap ahead of you, a career you path you've identified, matches your interests, looks pretty solid to begin. Almost there, really. You're over three quarters of the way through the journey. And in June that year, you're 21 and something rather significant happens. Tell me about June 18th that year. Yeah, so you're spot on, Alex. It's kind of one of those things that if for those listening who have gone through RMC, it, it can be pretty full on time. And the finish line was definitely in sight. And having sort of six months to go of, you know, almost four years of training, all I had in my mind was to graduate as a lieutenant. You know, like I said, I wanted to do a RAOC logistics and then go on with my army career, look to get deployed, do what everyone joins up to do, basically. And it was June 18th. And it was, uh, I remember the day because it was my dad's birthday, which is why I'll, I'll always remember that day. And yeah, basically I just called my dad up to wish him happy birthday. I think we just finished, you know, some morning drill that morning in, in freezing Canberra. I think it was, you know, negative three degrees or something like that. And I just called him up to wish him happy birthday on a completely unrelated side. And I said, uh, look, dad, I've got this, uh, this lump on my right testicle. Um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts? And I remember he kind of said, well, look, mate, you know, it's, you should just go off to the doctor, which, uh, which makes sense. But I think at the time being a young, naive 21 year old male with six months left of RMC, I, I thought I was bulletproof if you want to want to call it that. And a lot of young men do, but look, I said, okay, and that's, uh, that makes sense. So I went across to the, the army GP, which is literally probably a 20 meter walk from my room <laughs> at RMC. So there was really no excuse for me not to do it. And, uh, yeah, went over there and pulled down my Dax and he, uh, had a bit of a feel around my, my testicle as they do. And basically, uh, yeah, within 24 hours, I got sent off for an ultrasound. And once again, did not think anything of it and got a call back to say, hey, look, mate, we got the results back from the ultrasound. Uh, I want to see you in my rooms and to go through the results. And basically, he just came out and said, and he said, look, mate, you've, uh, you've actually got testicular cancer. So it was a bit of a shock because, you know, <laughs> it all happened pretty quick. And like you just touched on, Alex, you know, I'm a 21 year old male, I'm fit and healthy six months left of training to become a, a young young officer in the Australian Army and you, you're finding yourself in a doctor's room being told you had testicular cancer. It's, uh, it's not something that you expect to hear. Before we just progress with that part of the story, I do think it's super important to touch on. I know this is a cause you're really promoting today, which we'll get to later, but the fact is you did look at the fact, oh, there's a problem here. I probably need to look at it. And yes, you needed your father's sort of validation to actually go and do it. And I can appreciate from the young man's perspective, that's a bit confronting or the idea of a GP having a feel down there. But yeah. it is good that you spoke up to your dad and did that because some young men would find that hard. And also I find it impressive because not not every guy would necessarily be uh, paying that much attention to to identify the lump of that. I suppose it look it depends on the size and all that kind of thing. But it's yeah. impressive that you identified that there was a problem as well. It's um that sort of self care in terms of finding it and doing something about it is really important because you know in this instance it saved your life. No, and then that's exactly right. And it's it's one of those things. Now I'm so like you said, I'm so passionate about letting young men know because. I just got told I had testicular cancer. I knew nothing about testicular cancer, right? But it's the most common cancer for young men aged 15 to 30. So it is a young man's cancer, yet why hadn't I heard about it? And everyone I told, they're kind of like, what? But you're so young. And it's, you don't realize, well, actually, for when young men do get cancer, this is typically the one they get. But it's just the education piece of people not realizing that. And, and like you touched on, it's, it's as simple as just being aware of your body. And 
And, you know, yeah, you might not feel your testicles every day for all those, you know, men out there listening, but it's one of those things that after getting out of the shower and I say getting out of the shower, cause that's when, that's when they say it's the best time to have a feel around. So all the lads listening out there, next time you get out of the shower, you, you kind of just have a bit of a feel around. If there's any abnormalities, any little hard lump at all, that just, just doesn't seem right. And you'll know, cause it will just be like, well, that just doesn't feel right. That's an indication that it might not be testicular cancer, but at least it will get you off to, to go to the doctor, hopefully. So back to your story, you've had this shock diagnosis. How do the things progress from there in terms of treatment and so on? Yeah, so look, basically it happened pretty quick as in testicular cancer can spread pretty quickly. And you might be familiar with Lance Armstrong. Unfortunately, he's now known for the the bike cheat as opposed to being a testicular cancer survivor, but it it spreads upwards and his spread very quickly until it got to his brain and he had had some tumors in his brain. So it can be quite deadly if you don't get onto it. So yeah, basically within 48 hours, I was scheduled in for surgery or roughly a couple of days to uh, surgery to remove the affected testicle, which is what they did. They removed the testicle. It was a pretty basic surgery or operation, I guess since what I've now experienced, but they got it out, removed the cancer, and I did choose to get a, a fake testicle, which is a bit of a side story, but they put the, put the fake testicle in and I went on with, uh, with my life. And, and I thought at the time, shit, wasn't that a, you know, a random bloody thing to go through? Like I thought, well, gee, I, I, at least I was lucky. And I kind of went on with my, my army training and that was that and didn't think much of it until I unfortunately had a follow-up CT scan a couple months later. We'll come back to the fake testicle later. So <laughs> what did the uh, CT scan reveal? Well, unfortunately it revealed, um, like I said, it can spread pretty quickly and it actually had spread. So I thought I was out of the woods and that wasn't the case to be. So it had spread to all my abdominal lymph nodes, which wasn't ideal because uh, not knowing much about cancer at the time, I, I did know that generally if cancer spreads, it's not great. So at this stage, I had two months left from graduating. <laughs> so it was really the home stretch, if you want to call it that. And he basically said, because it's spread, mate, your only options here are now are chemotherapy, pretty intensive chemotherapy, which I chose to have in my hometown of Adelaide. But I put that off for a couple months at no detriment to my health, which meant I could still graduate with my class. Because, you know, after four years of training, all I wanted to do was graduate. And I felt like if I had to pull out with two months to go, it would have just made it that much more difficult. So to know that I could have at least still graduated with all my mates, with my class members, with my family who flew over from Adelaide to at least watch me graduate through the big passing out parade. I could at least have that proud moment before I embarked on a pretty intensive course of chemotherapy. Well, it sounds like it was an important aspect of your mental health to do that. And it's an interesting comparison that the testicular cancer has to be addressed so quickly for fear of it spreading. And then once it had spread the abdominal region, the uh, urgency was far scaled back. Yeah, look, I think it's because it's the timeline of spreading. So it had spread pretty quickly to my abdominal lymph nodes, but they said, look, two months probably isn't going to be a deal breaker for it to spread to any sort of vital organs. So I kind of had a little bit of a buffer and I got you know, second and third opinions who supported that. So it wasn't a decision I took lightly, but I did have a bit of um, backing to say, look, a two-month buffer, you should be all right, and then we'll get straight into your chemo, which, which is what I did. So I graduated, got the two pips on my shoulder, and then I suppose when all my mates were getting their postings and, and enjoying their Christmas leave and ready to embark on a long military career, uh, as little as six days after graduating, I was uh, commencing my first round of chemotherapy back home in, in Adelaide. Before we uh, get to the chemo, how did the the first diagnosis and then the follow-up on the abdominals, did that impact on your study much? Obviously, you would have had time out for surgery, I guess, but how else did it impact on your final months at RMC? Yeah, look, it definitely did, Alex. I didn't get my graduation on a silver platter by any means, but there was one field exercise stability operations that I I was unable to do due to my, my health situation and my recovery and what was going on. However, that wasn't a detriment to me graduating. So I still ticked all the boxes I had to do. I still passed all the field components I had to pass. I still went on, you know, the shaggy ridge field exercise that a lot of officers will be very well aware of. So I still did all those major parts of the training. There was only just one little field exercise at the end, which I was unable to do, but I still managed to graduate. And and like I probably touched on in my story, I'm just so fortunate with the support that the army have provided me. And even during those early days, flying me back to Adelaide and the support they provided was immense to help me get through it. Let's jump back to when you're in Adelaide and you're starting the chemotherapy because like you said, there's that 
obviously the getting through chemotherapy component, which is this whole battle, which you can enlighten us on, but then also you're watching all your mates from your class you've just graduated with going on to do their other things. That was probably the harder part, to be honest. Like, yeah, chemo isn't fun. You know, I lost all my hair and I was sick and I was, you know, by the toilet bowl and I was very fatigued and I I was in hospital for a week getting smashed with these chemo drugs and I'd have two weeks to rest up and another week in. I did that for about four months. And look, it was difficult. You know, as a 20, I was 22 at this stage. You're a 22 year old, you know, you're you're skinny and you're frail and you're fatigued. You're looking at yourself in the mirror thinking, this is not who I am. This is not where I expected to be. So it was a difficult moment. And then on top of that, to then see all my classmates from RMC posted around Australia and some of them were already looking at getting deployments and living their military career, which was what I wanted to do. And then I'm stuck in a hospital with so many unknowns. I just felt like it was not where I wanted to be and not where I thought I'd be. So look, it was difficult to, I guess, comprehend all that. Sounds like quite a traumatic sort of life outlook perspective shift you have to make at that very young age that as most young men, we do think we're invincible at that age and we have all these goals and life plans set out. And the testicular cancer one, at least that was able to be schedule a quick removal and you had a quick follow up on that. Whereas this one, I, I can't imagine that struggle of endless battle of going in and out of chemo and the effects that have on your body. And also I imagine you're questioning where you'll be left at the end of this. Yeah, exactly. That was the difficult part. And that's what eventually what happened. I got through the four months and eventually got there. And unfortunately, I had that follow-up scan to see if the cancer had gone, but unfortunately it hadn't hadn't all gone yet. So the chemo hadn't quite done its job, which once again, that was also another bit of a punch in the guts because it's like, you know, you, you think that you're almost there. And then once again, you get pulled right back down. It was another huge hurdle. And and then, yeah, I then had to go in for a surgery to remove uh, every one of the abdominal lymph nodes, which the surgery is called retroperineal lymph node dissection. It's a pretty pretty full on surgery. They, they literally make about a 30 centimeter incision down your, your front, your abdominal region open you right up. They clamp you right open, put all your vital organs and intestines and everything. They literally rest it on your chest and then they go in and take out all your abdominal lymph nodes. And I think I had about 46 or so. And it was about an eight hour operation. And it was, I suppose to put it in perspective, the surgeon had only done one of those surgeries in the previous two years. So it wasn't exactly like a a surgery that they do often. And there are lots of uh, potential side effects and complications. But eight hours later, luckily, I didn't have any of those complications. And he he got rid of all the cancer and he got rid of all the lymph nodes. And then I spent a a week or so on ICU and the next few weeks in hospital. But, uh, and you know, that wasn't wasn't fun, obviously, eating ice chips and, and just lengthy recovery and rehab, but eventually I kind of got through it, which was a bit of a journey. But once again, the army were very supportive and I kind of just put my army career on hold for a while. How is your mental health outlook or your attitude during this time? I'm pretty open now, Alex, with my mental health. And I wasn't at the time, I definitely hit it or I definitely wasn't as open as I am now. But now I realize the importance of being open with your mental health. And I definitely struggled a lot. And I've definitely had bouts of depression throughout my journey. I try and be as positive and optimistic as I can. And I think one of the most positive parts of what I've gone through in my journey And I keep touching on it because I'm so, so I'm a huge advocate for what the army have done for me because, you know, to still have a full-time job and to still be supported financially and to still have almost like a family of army, you know, support around you. It's so hard to comprehend how valuable that was to my, my overall mental health, but also my loved ones, my family members and those close to me to have that support network of the army was invaluable. And it's something that I'm just so fortunate about that they have had that support. And it, it really did help me get through, especially some of those darker days as well. So the army has really lived up to that rather classic ideal of mateship we talk about so much in Australia. No, absolutely. And look, I understand that there are probably people listening who may have not had good experience with as far as the medical side of things with the support they've had for the army. And, and look, there's always going to be different varying stories. But for me personally, I'm just so fortunate, like you said, the mateship component, but also just the, the overall support the army have provided me has just been, been unbelievable and something that I'll be forever thankful for. Well, Hugo, you beat the cancer eventually. How long did that take to expel that from your system? So I got a compassionate posting to Adelaide. The whilst I was undergoing chemotherapy, whilst I was recovering from my pretty intensive operation, I was still trying to work. So I'd still rock up to the headquarters I was at, you know, with my bald head, pretty sick. And I'd still do do some half days when I could just to do something, you know, because you, you got to try and do something. Yeah, basically spent two years on a compassionate posting, just doing as much as I could. And at a headquarters level, they tried to expose me to some of the logistical sides of things that I might experience later on in my career career. So that was great. 
So it felt like I was still contributing to some degree. And then I suppose after two years of, of really just getting back to fitness recovery and everything like that and passing a few scans, I suppose, I got my first, I call it my first official posting to Woodside Barracks in South Australia. And that was a kind of a, a proud moment because I felt like I was finally, finally getting a proper posting as a young lieutenant. And I was, by then I was what, two years cancer free. I had my follow-up CT scans. I was fit and healthy. And then sort of my target then was to get upgraded. That was my goal was to get medically upgraded so I could get deployed. And, you know, that was like most people who joined the army. That was my goal that I always had. So that was, yeah, that was that. And I spent the next two years at Woodside Barracks as a troop commander, you know, went out on field exercises, lived the logistic life, had a mixture of sort of transport, supply work, and I loved it. It was really enjoyable. And I kind of forgot about my cancer story, which was good. I felt normal again, which was fantastic. And then it wasn't until the end of 2017 when I got promoted to captain. So I spent four years as a lieutenant, albeit two being that compassionate posting I mentioned. Then I spent two years at Woodside and then I got promoted to captain in the army. And it was definitely a proud moment because not only had I got medically upgraded, so it meant I was finally fit for deployment, but just standing alongside my family and there's a a photo of my dad and me with the promotion it was a proud moment because I felt like I, cancer no longer defined who I was. And I felt like finally I was a serving member of the army who could contribute and who could live that life that I wanted to live in the army. So it was a special moment. That was the yeah, end of 2017. And that's really special that you've gone through these trying circumstances, you overcome it and you get to, yeah, like you said, embrace that lifestyle, feel normal again. And then it's June 2018. It's the five-year mark from that original cancer diagnosis Mm. what happens in june 2018 yeah so you could almost call it the cherry on top i got posted to brisbane which is where i currently am with my lovely partner and i got posted to to nine fsb in amberley as the two ic of a supply company and you know i was ready to embark on on hopefully a pretty lengthy career and yeah the cherry on top was in june 18th like you mentioned i got my five-year clear ct scan for testicular cancer so for those listening who have been affected either personally or, or a family member has been affected by cancer, the five-year mark typically for cancer is kind of the milestone that most survivors strive towards because it officially means you're in complete remission and the percentages of any sort of relapse is almost none. And so it was a, I remember the day well, I cracked open a bottle of champagne with my partner and we kind of had a cheers and celebrated that pretty massive milestone. We were living a, a great life in Brisbane and got that all clear CT scan for testicular cancer, which was just, yeah, fantastic news that's a great way you can just completely close that book and move on. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I, I was still passionate to not forget what I'd gone through. I still was a proud survivor, more so to educate other young men. And that's what I was passionate about. But to think that I'd beaten cancer and I'd never be affected by cancer again, like I'd be lying if I said that wasn't going through my mind to think that, okay, that's great. I've done that and been through it and away I go. But unfortunately, <laughs> that was uh, that was short-lived. <laughs> Although it wasn't a a relapse for my testicular cancer, I unfortunately, uh, two months later, had another battle on my hands. And this this time, it was nothing to do with testicular cancer. But I uh, found myself in the doctor's office literally two months later in August last year. So it was actually a year very recently, 6th of August. Basically, I I was having some complications with my gut. Uh, nothing too too drastic, but it was just a bit of you know I don't know inconsistent bowel movements, a few stomach aches, like nothing too too alarming. But it was enough, I suppose, to get me to or prompt me to go to a doctor. And I suppose this is the silver lining, if you want to call it that, is that what I'd learned as being a young twenty one year old Hugo who was naive and didn't go off to that doctor, and and that's when the testicular cancer spread. I realised the importance of being proactive with your health. And it prompted me to go to the doctor and thought, you know, something isn't right here. I'm going to, I'm going to go see the doctor. And that's what I did. And he said, look, yep. All right. No worries. Well, we'll, uh, we'll send you off for a colonoscopy, which is a pretty simple procedure and we'll have a look what's going on. And that's what he did. And he, I went off for a colonoscopy and unfortunately, two days later, got a call from the receptionist office to say, look, uh, your doctor wants to see you to go through the results. And uh, at that point in time, I remember the feeling well, I was sitting in my office and I just had this sinking feeling in my stomach that, uh, that something wasn't right. And what was the diagnosis? Basically went to the appointment with my partner and I was in my camos and, and um, DPCU and put that brave face on. And as soon as I saw the doctor, my gastroenterologist, I knew something wasn't right. And he pulled me into his office with my partner and he turned the computer screen around and he basically just came out and said it. He said, um, mate, I'm sorry to say, but the biopsy came back and, and you've got bowel cancer. I remember the feeling 
like it was yesterday. And it was almost like a bit of a blur. But to hear those words again, you have bowel cancer, only two months, two months after I just got given an all clear CT scan, my five yearly CT scan for testicular cancer was just so hard to take in because I felt like I was on such a high. I felt like for the, the first time in such a long time, I was, I was happy. I was free. Cancer didn't define who I was. I was ready to embark on my military career, you know, enjoy my life with my partner. And then just to feel that feeling for only two months and then to get brought right back down again, it just, it was such a hard feeling to explain, but it was, it was pretty difficult to take in. On this podcast, we talk about mental resilience a lot. And often that's in the context of maybe it's a particularly horrific contact or it's losing a colleague or any number of traumatic events that come along, but life throws its traumas at us in all sorts of ways. And we have to deal with that in our lives, in the course of our careers. And what you've just described is such a height of trauma to have gone through that journey, the depths you were describing when you were in chemo in Adelaide, to come out on the other side and to feel like it is well and truly behind you, to be at what must have been such a great high, the highest of highs, and then just brought back so soon after. I can't imagine that emotional roller coaster. Yeah, and that's it. Definitely was that was the most difficult part. Like you just mentioned, spot on the, the emotional roller coaster, and it exactly was that. It was just so difficult, and I. It wasn't until I left the the doctor's rooms, and I was with my partner, and and I remember I was just walking slightly in front of her, and I was trying to be optimistic, but then I just kind of just broke down in tears, and it was just this. All my emotions just came out, and I was just so upset and just you know afraid, and I just didn't know what to expect, and I just felt like I was defeated. Whereas I felt like I'd conquered my testicular cancer, and I was I was embracing it. Whereas this time I felt so vulnerable and like I was defeated, and it was uh, it was a very difficult time to then go on and call all my family members, you know, call my twin brother and my parents, and and I remember calling them up in the car and just going, yeah, look, I've um. You know, I got diagnosed with bowel cancer and just to hear their pain in their voice. And it's something that I've, I've realized over my journey that it's something like cancer or mental illness or any adversity that you go through, it affects so much more than just the individual. And the pain it causes your family members or those close to you, you know, is just as, just as powerful. And, and to me, it was probably one of the more difficult parts is to know that I was causing so much pain for others as well. Yes, it must add an extra burden of weight because in a ridiculous way, but understandable way at the same time, you probably feel guilty for sort of being Mm. the one bearing this condition or this news that you know you're causing pain. No matter what face they put up, you can't do anything about it. They're going to be hurting. Mm, Absolutely. And yet I did feel guilty at parts because I knew that, well, everyone's going to have to now worry about what Hugo's doing and Hugo's about to embark on another cancer journey and it's all going to be about Hugo again and let's feel sorry for Hugo. And it's just like he's, yeah, I'll touch on again because it is, it's spot on the emotional roller coaster that goes with that it's a difficult thing to take in so the actually having the bowel cancer is that in any way connected to what you had before the testicular cancer and how it spread to the abdominal region or is it just its own separate cancer that struck you and lightning has struck twice in a way look yeah unfortunately mate it's uh, very much i got struck by lightning twice it's not related at all it's completely uh, it's a separate malignancy it's not related at all to testicular cancer i've even very recently only i've got the results back uh, last week i've actually had genetic testing done to see if i'm predisposed to certain mutations in my cells which some people are i'm not i've got normal cells i've got no predisposition to anything like that so i guess you can just call it really bad luck <laughs> So you have that diagnosis and you're calling family members, you're going through the trauma and you know very well what's coming more or less. Maybe not all the medical detail for this specific variation, but you know the journey ahead of you. Mm -hmm. What does this journey involve in terms of treatment? Yeah. So look, lucky, when I say lucky, I did get in early. So this is why I'm so, so passionate and early detection in any medical condition is paramount for this reason. Bowel cancer kills more young Australians from 25 to 30 than any other cancer. It's also the second biggest cancer killer out of anything behind lung cancer for anyone. So it is a pretty dangerous killer, but there's not much, I guess, exposure to something like bowel cancer. And I suppose what makes these statistics more alarming is that it's so highly preventable and so highly curable if detected early. So there's really no excuse why these figs are killing so many people because it's highly curable if you detect it early. But unfortunately, people are putting off symptoms and signs and and not getting the screening kits when they get sent it and they're not getting detected early. So I suppose, yeah, to answer your question, Alex, I, I had detected it early, but I still had to go in for some pretty immediate surgery to remove my my large bowel or, the, or your colon. 
basically a t- as little as two days later, I think it was yeah three days later, I went in for surgery to remove my about 90% of my large bowel. So if you kind of think about your biology days, your, your large bowel is kind of the almost upside down U-shaped sausage, if you want to call it that in your bowel. Um, and they removed most of that. 90%, yeah. So unfortunately, that's where all the cancer was and they removed it all. Fortunately, it hadn't spread and the cancer was completely um, riddled throughout that part of the bowel, which is pretty incredible. So they managed to keep a little bit intact, which means I can live a pretty normal life. Like, yeah, I still have more bowel movements than your normal person. I still can't eat a lot of foods that the normal person can eat. But overall, I can live a pretty normal life. So that's what I did. I went in for that surgery and removed the large bowel. And, uh, and you know, unfortunately, I had a little bit of a side note with that. I had an emergency operation thrown in there, which, which almost did kill me, which wasn't great. And then I spent about four weeks in hospital. I couldn't eat or drink for about three weeks, not even a sip of water because my stomach literally had to wake back up. And I lost about 22 kilos, which uh, I'm a pretty skinny guy as it was. So I was literally like skin and bone after that. <laughs> Definitely by far the darkest days I've ever had those four weeks in hospital when I, I just didn't think I actually was going to get better because every day was the same. It was almost like Groundhog Day. But eventually I, uh, <laughs> I worked my way through it. Can you tell me a bit more about the emergency surgery? The initial surgery itself actually went really well. So I was only in hospital for about, you know, I was only meant to be in hospital for about five, six days. So they took out the nasal gastric tube out of my nose. They took out the catheter. They took out all my pain relief. And I remember I was sitting on a, on a chair, eating a you know, turkey sandwich ready to discharge from the hospital. <laughs> And I was thinking, this is actually pretty good. Like it actually surprised me. I'm like, geez, if I don't have to have chemo and this is all I have to have, I thought, gee, this is actually not too bad. But then I started going downhill very quickly. And, you know, I've experienced a little bit of pain in my life here and there for different various reasons, but this was by far the most excruciating pain I've ever felt. And to put it in perspective, I remember it got to a point where the doctors were coming in and they're injecting morphine, quite a high dose of morphine straight into my stomach and then having ketamine patches either side. And there was just no pain relief at all. Like this was just excruciating pain. So they knew it was pretty serious. And basically the nurse called the emergency button and it was a Saturday. So my actual surgeon had his day off. And I remember he was, uh, he was out riding his bike and he got this buddy, um, wage, this um, text message to say that I was going downhill pretty quick. So he literally rushed straight into hospital in his Lycra, <laughs> straight off his bike. And here I am curled up in a ball in horrific pain and he realized it was serious and so he then said we have to rush me off for surgery and i remember i was in such such bad pain and on so many pain relief so i physically couldn't actually sign the consent form so look my dad was by my side and he uh, he had to sign the the consent form which actually had on it in case i died it was basically as a father waving the rights in case that i died on the operating table I suppose what actually happened is because I've been opened up about six or seven times now in my abdominal region, there was so much existing scar tissue. And the way my surgeon explained it to me, picture like a spider web. So there was like a spider web of scar tissue in my stomach and it had kind of completely twisted and kinked the remaining colon, the small bowel and the intestine. So it was almost like I'd swallowed a hand grenade, if you can picture that. And there's like a explosion going off in my stomach that was horrific. And so he literally had to physically manhandle my stomach back together after about four or five hours. After all that happened, he actually said it was the worst he'd seen for 15 years. And he said, if I'd waited even half an hour, so half an hour had gone by, he said it most likely would have killed me. So, you know, you hear those things and you think, Jesus Christ, like the journey I'd gone through with all this cancers and chemos and surgeries and all of this. And here was this one little half an hour that would have gone by and I could have just ended it then and there. So it's just it's one of those amazing things that I'm fortunate that he did such an amazing job, albeit like I touched on briefly before, it did mean I had to spend the next sort of three, four weeks in a pretty, uh, pretty bad way in hospital. And from there, how's your timeline of discharge and I guess getting back to work? Yeah, so I eventually did discharge and I basically took the rest of that year off. So that was this time last year. So it's still pretty recent. It's only literally been a year since all this happened and it was a significant recovery and rehab. So I did work a bit from home, but once again, first and foremost, the army always said to me, your health is first and foremost, worry about your health. 
So I spent the next couple of months leading into end of last year, recovering from home, trying to be as active as I could and basically just, just doing what I could really and trying to put myself in the best sort of positive mind frame as well as far as my mental health went because I did struggle a lot with my mental health. And um, eventually I, I did get through it all and it kind of brought me into the start of this year when I was kind of, you know, relatively fit again, which was great. And I built up a lot of strength again. And I kind of continued this year as, as I touched on earlier on the episode as the unit welfare officer, uh, which is something I'm obviously passionate in. And I felt like I could contribute again. However, you know, that being said, I'm still on active treatment. I'm still on active immunotherapy treatment. I've still got inflammation in my remaining bowel. Uh, there is still a significant chance I might need further surgery to remove that part of my bowel if I can't sort the, uh, the inflammation out, which would require meaning I'd live with a, a stoma or a colostomy bag for the rest of my life, which would definitely affect my military service. But look, they're daily sort of things I have to just deal with, unfortunately. It's the fear of the unknown is definitely real for me. And I'm going to have three monthly colonoscopies basically for the rest of my life, <laughs> as long as I have that bit of remaining bowel left. So look, I've, look, I've still got hurdles to overcome. But sitting here today... From what I'd gone through, I can't complain too much seeing where I was this time last year. That is a really brilliant outlook on life, Hugo. Before we talk about more your work as the unit welfare officer and 25 Stay Alive, I want to bring up a lighter note uh, we touched on earlier. I hear you have a party trick in relation to your fake testicle. <laughs> yeah, yeah so the, my fake testicle is a funny one. Like it's, to me, it's just so bizarre. Like it's such a minor, minor detail of my journey now, but people still definitely find it quite hilarious. And even even back when I chose the fake testicle, you know, you need to realize I'm 21. You've just been told you got cancer. Like it's a pretty serious topic, right? And I'm uh, sitting there with my urologist and he's saying, right, mate, what fake testicle do you want? And I'm coming. Like, <laughs> Choose your own testicle. I'm all right. Well, what do you mean? And I, he, he, fit, he literally, I kid you not, brought out this briefcase looking thing and there were different makes, models and sizes of these fake testicles. So here I am playing around with this silicon based one. He's like, this one's a popular one from the US. I'm trying to pick out what I wanted to have. And I remember saying to him, yep, I'll choose that one. Then he said, all right, what size do you want? And I said, um, I don't know, just a normal size testicle. And he said, well, some guys actually choose to get a bigger testicle, <laughs> which I, t I don't know why, maybe, maybe for the novelty component. But I just said, look, if you match it up with the other guy, I'll be happy, which is what he did. So looking from the outset, not that I'll, uh, I'll show, you, show you now, Alex, but you wouldn't even know that I've got, a <laughs> I've got a fake testicle. And I have found it funny over the years when I've been with mates and we've had a few drinks and people that don't know I've got a fake testicle you kind of get the testicle out after a few drinks. And uh, cause I can't feel anything at all at all. There's no pain at all. It's just like this random bit of silicon in my, <laughs> in my um, testicle region. It's after a few drinks, I might get it out and um, you know, do a few little, uh, few little party tricks with it. And let's just say for those who don't think it's fake, the, uh, the expressions are pretty, <laughs> pretty priceless when they see what I'm, I'm doing to a testicle. Again, it's great. We're finding the, silver linings and these battles you've overcome well that's it and that you know what if it, if someone looking at that it encourages them to go through their testicles and you know it gets them to be proactive with their health then hey it's a win-win <laughs> and that reminds me actually we talked about before the very practical way uh, men can look after themselves uh, by looking out for their health in terms of the testicular cancer i'm hesitant to be dr google in regards to the bowel cancer because i know those things are more complex and if you google symptoms you have you think you're going to die in three minutes often. But what are some of the things people can do for something like bowel cancer as a survivor of it uh, that they can do to, if they're worried or paranoid or just want to be proactive, what's something they can do to check? The main symptoms, if you're worried, is bowel movements. So the best way to explain it, you know what your normal is. You know what your normal bowel movements are. Anything that's different to that for more than two weeks is the general rule and thumb, not that I came up with, that medical professionals will tell you, is generally alarm bells to think something's probably not right. So if you've got you know, diarrhea or constipation or whatever, different irregular bowel movements for more than two weeks, it's generally signs to go, hey, I need to go to a doctor. The other ones are if you've got any sort of abdominal pain or consistent cramping in your bowel that once again is going on for a significant amount of time. But the biggest, the number one biggest one is, is if you ever see any sort of blood in your stool at all, you need to go straight off to the doctor. That's the biggest one. So it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily have bowel cancer. So don't next time you have a bit of blood in your stool, go, holy shit, I've got bowel cancer because it could be hemorrhoids. It could be all sorts of things. It could be polyps, but it's the number one rule they say is if you've got any sort of blood at all, in your bowel movements to go off straight to the doctor. And that's the number one thing that unfortunately, believe it or not, there are people out there who have these types of symptoms going on for significant amounts of times 
and they don't do anything about it. Well, you're obviously quite the passionate and now quite informed advocate for spreading the message. Tell me about your role in the army today and how you've branched that out into the 25 Stay Alive movement. Yeah, so look, it's at the start of this year, my commanding officer approached me and he said, look, mate, I know you've still got hurdles to overcome. You know, I know you're going to be out and about with medical appointments and stuff, but I know you're passionate in the welfare space. He said, it makes a lot of sense. There's a position that opened up. Would you want to be the unit welfare officer for the unit? And straight away, I said, that'd be fantastic because it meant I could focus on my own health when I am at work, I could also, um, I guess, contribute in the sense of, of what I love doing. And, you know, to me, it's not work. You know, I love, I love doing it. So at the start of the year, I stood up in front of my whole unit. And there's about sort of four or 500 people. And I shared my story in front of all the soldiers, officers. And I just really wanted from the outset to be vulnerable and to kind of say, look, hey, this is what I've gone through. Not for people to feel sorry for me. That's never been my intent. But so people realize that, holy shit, this is real. This can happen. And I thought by being vulnerable and sort of sharing some intimate details of my story, it could A, obviously make me a bit more approachable, but also it could make people realize sitting there going, holy shit, this is real. Uh, And if something is, you know, happening to me, it's going to make me go to a doctor. So I was pretty passionate in doing that early on, which is what I've done. And, And over kind of the course of this year, I've really connected with certain people who are going through their own adversity to say, not to compare it to say, oh, mine's worse than yours, because no one goes through any worse than anyone else. Everyone's unique and everyone's adversity is their own adversity, right? So it's more to say that, hey, look, I'm here and I can, I can understand in parts of what you're going through, but also just to have kind of someone to talk to, which I think is really, really important. And I suppose from outside of my military, what I'm doing as my day-to-day military job, I had this epiphany during my recovery days where I had a lot of people saying that, you know, they were feeling sorry for me and, oh, that's so unfair. You've gone through these two battles with cancer and you poor thing. And I realized that, well, A, I'm actually one of the lucky ones because there are so many people that succumb to things like cancer. But B, I realized that when I shared my story that I definitely wasn't unique and I definitely wasn't alone. And I realized there were so many people out there with their own story, whether that be through other cancers, mental health battles. There were so many people out there with their own stories to tell. And I thought that there wasn't enough there to either help those people, but also to educate others so they don't hopefully have to get to the situation that I've gone through. So I ended up creating a, an initiative or a community called 25 Stay Alive. And basically 25 Stay Alive encompasses the younger demographic and it educates and inspires younger people to be proactive with their health and sort of how they can face and overcome adversity. It symbolizes that When you turn 50, you get your screening kits in the mail. Women get their mammogram things for breast cancers. You know, you get your bowel cancer screening kits. It's kind of, it seems to be when you turn 50, that's when people start taking their health seriously. It's kind of like, that's when, you know, (laughs) that's when they start to go, oh, now I'm 50, I'm going to start getting unwell. And I thought, well, hang on, it shouldn't happen at 50. It should happen well before 50s. That's where 25 came. I said, it should happen half of that. So 25 stay alive was born because of that. And basically, I'm now just devoted and passionate in spreading my story and the stories of others to make people realize that A, they're not invincible. That's the first and foremost. You're not invincible. It doesn't matter if you're you know, 20, 30, 40, or 50. B, something like cancer doesn't discriminate. But the biggest one is for them to realize that they can actually prevent these very preventable diseases and illnesses too, so they can be proactive with their health. So that's kind of my mission or, or side note to the army. And it's kind of what I've devoted my spare time doing whilst in between army work and medical appointments is to just, yeah, I suppose, have this passion to create a community to help others really. We're having such a great growth in national conversation about things like conversations on mental health and depression, and we're having a really tragic contagion of veteran suicide at the moment, and that's a big area of conversation that rightfully is getting a lot of attention and Mm. needs a lot of fixing. And it's great to have advocates such as yourself who've gone through the physical side, because I think a lot of people would associate cancer with being older. Absolutely. But like you say, there's some massive killers of young people out there that are these other types of cancer and it's spreading that awareness and 
yeah, like you say, you're creating a community, which I think is really important and special and sought to raise that awareness. I know you've done walks and fundraising and awareness campaigns. You started the 25 Stay Alive podcast as well. I thought, well, how can I take this a step further? And, and that's exactly right. So I do lots of um, lots of fundraising events. I've recently got one up in Queensland, an 84 kilometer walk over two days, which is all to do with bowel cancer prevention. I also raise a lot of money for mental health for November as well, which, uh, which obviously I'm a huge advocate for, but also the podcast, like you touched on. And honestly, like you would be well aware, Alex, it's something that people probably don't realize how much work goes into something like a podcast. Oh, uh, yeah. People- People just listen to the end result and go, wasn't that a great 50 minute sort of episode between those two guys having a chat? But the energy that goes into just speaking to your guests or editing an episode and like committing the time that goes into it. And I obviously know how passionate you are, Alex, with what you've done, the amazing work you've done with this podcast. There, there is a lot that goes into it. But at the same time, there's nothing more rewarding than when you can do a podcast like this and let's say it just impacts one person that listens to this one person and they go you know holy shit that's either changed my perspective or it's made me do something about what i'm doing and it's been so powerful when i get these messages i had the message from a young male the other day who coincidentally is at rmc at the moment and he messaged me saying hey mate i just want to let you know i I heard your podcast i listened to your story and uh, it prompted me to go to the doctor and I got diagnosed with testicular cancer. But the good news is I got in early and I didn't have to have any further treatment. So you hear these stories and you think, holy shit, how powerful is that? So much more rewarding than anything on a monetary sense when you can actually realize that you're actually helping other people's lives. Like it's so powerful and that's what I'm, uh, yeah, I'm pretty passionate about doing with this podcast as well. Yeah, you're super effectively, not just raising awareness, but throwing away any inherited from previous generations, I guess, taboos about talking about health. We've had open chats just in this uh, conversation today about how to check your body and bodily functions and that kind of thing. And I'm sure a few people listening have, might have felt uncomfortable about that. And that's something that needs to, although maybe it's not always breakfast conversation, it's still something that needs to be more open in society because we all have bodies and we all at one stage or another will have something go wrong with them. No, you know what? That is the core, the fundamental core behind some of our key values because it's exactly that. Why when you talk about poo, do people kind of go, oh, that's, you can't, you can't, it's, a, it's almost like a taboo topic, but it's something we all do. Every human, every life form does it where, you know, if you said, you know, I had a shower this morning, no one blinks twice, but you know, there you are pretty intimate naked in a shower, but no one blinks twice where it's like, if you say I had a poo, it's kind of like, Oh, what? That's disgusting. But these are the conversations we need to have because normalizing these conversations is what will save lives. And I think it stems further than that to what you touched on before, Alex, with mental health. It's a huge one. You know, something like suicide kills more people aged 15 to 44 than anything else. Anything else. Suicide. Like to me, it's just mind boggling. And I suppose normalizing the conversation around mental health is also so important. Like, why when we go to the catch up with a mate for a drink, you ask how the gym went or you ask, you know, oh, I went to my chiropractor and he did this, this and that. Whereas if you mention you're seeing a psychologist, it's kind of like, oh, what? Like it's almost this, this taboo thing that you can't talk about. It needs to change because these statistics are just alarming. I think normalizing these conversations as a part of everyday life will go a long, long way in saving lives. Well, Hugo, I think you're leading the charge on that very effectively. For people who want to reach out or listen to your podcast, where can they find you in podcast apps and social media? Yeah, look, so the, uh, you know, 25 Stay Alive is kind of our our tag. So at 25 Stay Alive, we're on Instagram, Facebook. And then as far as the podcast goes, if you just search 25 Stay Alive, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all your your major podcast outlets. And, uh, but, you know, like I said, the best place to find us is probably on Instagram at 25 Stay Alive because we regularly do uh, the posts and share people's amazing inspirational stories. Well, Hugo, it is truly awesome work that you're doing. We're the same age and to see you go through all this and keep pushing and wanting to share your story so openly with the world and use it as a platform to help others, I find a real inspiration. So thank you for your service, the important work you're doing and for your time today. No, look, I really appreciate it, Alex. And it's an honor to be on this podcast and I love the work you're doing with it too, mate. Be sure to check out 25 Stay Alive. You can find us online too, at Life on the Line Podcast on Facebook and Instagram, at L-O-T-L Pod on Twitter, and at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. 
and lest we forget.